Um, all right, so today we're, we're going to continue with our discussion of, of cavities. Now, last time we talked only about the light inside of a cavity. And at first we talked about a perfect, uh, perfectly conducting cavity. And then we talked about the light inside of a cavity where there was some loss. And that loss comes from a million different places. You know, the slight imperfections in the, in the mirrors, uh, light leaking out around the edges of the mirrors, uh, the mirrors not being 100% reflective. And either that means there's some absorption, which you know, slightly heats up the metal in the mirrors, or there's some transmission where light leaks out. Um, and, and we saw that there were certain positions of the cavity where you would get this resonance condition where, where uh, the light can build up and constructively interfere. And um, but last time we, we were a little bit sloppy and we just considered the, the magnitude of the reflection. And we didn't really worry too much about the phase. This time we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about mirrors that are mostly reflective, but a little bit transmissive. So imagine you know, in, in, the, in the actual laser that we have in lab, the, the mirrors are something like 99% reflective. And, uh, and 1% of that light leaks, leaks out. And we, we have both a laser cavity where the laser, uh, you know, the gas of the laser, which we zap with electricity and, and that builds up light. We'll, we'll talk about the atomic physics of that a little bit later. But uh, maybe more relevantly, we also have a, 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 a analysis cavity, which really is just a pair of these 99% reflective mirrors. And I, they can be, be flat. We'll analyze the flat case today and we'll analyze the, the curved mirror case in, in the future. But what's amazing is if you have these two 99% reflective mirrors, um, you might think that you, you shine light on it and this first mirror is 99% reflective. So you would think that no matter what, what's going on, 99% of the light bounces off. Um, and if, if there was nothing else going on, if light was not a wave, uh, that, that would be true. But because light is a wave, that one little tiny percent that, that goes, goes inside, that can bounce around the cavity and build up. And what we'll see is that for, for certain distances, when we take into account all the bouncing around, there's a big, uh, a lot of light that builds up in the cavity. And it turns out that what little light leaks out from this big buildup of light destructively interferes with this. And uh, for the right distances, uh, it turns out that there's no ref back reflection, that all of the light ends up coming out after enough light has built up inside. And this is, this is I don't know, real, totally counterintuitive if, you, if you're thinking about light as just a particle or even in a simple picture of waves where you, know, you picture a wave coming in and it, most of it bounces off and then who knows what happens in here. If you really keep track of things carefully for certain distances, you, you get this very interesting effect where this, these pair of 99% reflective mirrors looks clear uh, to, to a very specific wavelength of light that has to do with this, this distance here. So, um, so that's what we use in lab to analyze the spectrum of our laser. We slowly change this distance a little bit and this cavity looks clear for a very narrow uh, set of wavelengths. And as we change this distance a little bit, the, the wavelengths that this cavity suddenly looks transparent to uh, changes. And we can control this distance and, and we, we can know this distance or at least measure it in various ways. And we can use that to analyze the spectrum of light. And so uh, that's, that's sort of where we're going today is I wanna, I wanna prove, prove that this actually works, that a pair of 99% reflective mirrors can look transparent to the right wavelength if, if arranged in the right way. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So the, the way we have to do that is we have to analyze what happens when light hits an interface a little bit more carefully than, than we've been doing. And that's, that's what these Stokes relations are all about. So let me, let me draw a, a better picture of this, which is here's, here's an interface. And you can imagine that this is an interface between air and glass, say. And if light comes in, there's some E 
E naught that's coming in. Some of it's going to reflect, and we'll call this R E naught, and some of it's going to transmit T E naught. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to take this angle to be zero. So we're not going to worry about any kind of uh, index of refraction and bending of the light because you know, you know, in the actual cavities we're interested in, we're going to shoot the light straight in. The problem with that is if I draw pictures where I'm shooting the light straight in, all the arrows overlap each other and it's kind of a mess. So I'm going to draw them all as coming in at some angle, but you can imagine taking the limit as this angle goes to zero and any any effects because of the angle, I'm not even going to bother writing because we're going to take take the limit as the angle goes to zero. So um, let's let's be a little bit clear about what's what's going on here. So um, let me remind you what what we're talking about. If I shine a light in and I'm drawing an arrow like that, it means that I'm drawing some some e plus of r, some complex complex wave, and this is what e naught refers to. It's the magnitude of this complex wave e to the i k dot r, and k is basically the the vector direction that I'm uh, that I'm shooting the light in, and the magnitude of k is just two pi over lambda. And if I were to turn this into an actual real electric field, E uh, as a function of r and t, this is E plus plus of r e to the minus i omega t. Remember the plus refers to the spatial part and the time part always has the opposite sign, minus its complex conjugate, e minus e to the plus i omega t. So this is the real electric field that, that we'll, we'll be dealing with. Um, let, me, let me not draw the, the vector on the electric field. Let me just imagine that uh, everything, all the, all the electric fields are, are vertically polarized. There's little arrows going up and down up and down. Uh, OK, so, so that's, that's what this E0 refers to. It's the magnitude, the complex magnitude of this plane wave. And once you have a plane wave with this complex magnitude, you can calculate the real wave associated with that by doing this procedure. Um, but you know, for ease of convenience, we'll be working with just the, the magnitude of the complex wave. And what that means is that when, when you reflect, we're talking about the, the amplitude of the wave, complex number amplitude. And when you reflect, this, this coefficient out here can, can be positive or negative or complex. It depends on whether the wave changes, changes sign or, uh, or gets a phase shift because of this reflection. So, so now we're going to be a little bit more careful. We're going to treat this reflection coefficient r and this transmission coefficient each as complex numbers. And these are the, the field, field reflection coefficients and the field, field transmission coefficients. So as, as opposed to the intensity. So, so the intensity of a wave is proportional to the the magnitude squared of, of this amplitude. And so when I say, when I say a mirror is 99% reflective, that almost always refers to the intensity. So what that means is that the magnitude squared of this component here is 99% of the magnitude squared of the incoming wave. And so for the kinds of lasers we're considering, our magnitude squared is going to be around uh, 0.0. 99. So, you know, may, maybe it's 98%, maybe it's 99.9% if you spend a lot of money, but uh, we're, we're, we're talking pretty high, high reflectivity here uh, for these mirrors. Okay, so now the Stokes relations are constraints on what are valid magnitudes and phases of R and T. So, you know, one obvious one is that you can't make, make light from nowhere, energy has to be conserved. So in some sense, the intensity coming in has to equal the intensity coming out uh, here plus the intensity coming out there. We'll, we'll, we'll get that eventually. But there's also relations on the phases that, that are maybe not so obvious. And 
it's useful to consider uh, the fact that all of Maxwell's equations, uh, oh, and, and these the relations on the phases come from the fact that Maxwell's equations are all time invariant, time reversal invariant. So Maxwell, Maxwell's equations are time reversal. I don't know why I capitalized that invariant. And, and what that means is if, if I write down Maxwell's equations and I take T and I send it to minus T and I uh, E of, of T stays the same. I just have to evaluate it at, at minus T. Uh, let me, sorry, this is not equals, this is goes to. So if I replace all the t's by minus t's and all the e, e of t's by e of minus t's, and this one's less, less obvious, but uh, if I replace all the b's by minus b of minus t, um, I, I get back the same set of Maxwell's equations. And this kind of makes sense in, in the sense that if you imagine waves of electromagnetism propagating in some direction, if you play the movie backwards, um, everything would look fine, except you just have to reverse the sign of B and then all the right-hand rule stuff works out. The reason why B has this funny property is because of the, the right-hand rule, it's, it's handed. Uh, but we almost never deal with B, B just kind of comes along for the ride in, in most of optics. So we just have to deal with a simpler case where you just reverse time and E, e stays the same, you just evaluate it at, at a different time. And, and in particular, the, the wave equation for E Laplacian of E minus one over C squared, two time derivatives. If I, if I take this and I send T to minus T, notice that each of these derivatives uh, picks, if I do a, a variable substitution, if I, if I let you know, T prime equal minus T, and I change variables in this derivative, each time derivative picks up a minus sign and two time derivatives therefore will pick up no sign. Oh, sorry, the wave equation actually sets this equal to zero. So if I have an E that satisfies the wave equation, the time reversed version of E also satisfies the wave equation. You know, if I show you a movie just of the electric field and I play it backwards, it's also a perfectly valid solution. Um, and that's, that's true of waves in free space, which is what this equation refers to. But because this is true of Maxwell's equations in general, it's also true of waves going through media and waves at interfaces. And uh, you, know, you have to be a little bit careful with sources, right? If you shake something, it makes a wave. What is the time reverse version of that? Well, it's a wave coming in and shaking the, the thing. So it sort of turns sources into uh, sinks, into receivers. Um, but uh, since we're not really worried about the source of these waves or, or how they get absorbed, um, we're not, we're not going to worry about that part yet. We're just going to worry about the interfaces. And what does this time reversal invariance say about, about this situation here? So let me, let me do that. Let me draw the time reversed version of that. Uh, I, I, let, me, let, me erase, let me erase everything and just sort of re, redraw. Um, I'm going to redraw this not with lines but with with waves, so you can sort of more more carefully see what's going on here. And then we'll we'll ask what is the time reversed version of that, and uh, it, it enforcing the time reversal symmetry will put constraints on our reflection and transmission coefficients, and then we when we use those constraints in a cavity we'll see this interesting effect where it actually looks, even super reflective mirrors look transparent for certain wavelengths. All right, so, so here's a forward, forward picture. I'm just gonna basically redraw that same picture with waves. Here's there's some wave coming in with amplitude E, E naught, some wave going out with reflection coefficient amp, uh, E naught, and there's a wave that continues to transmit with T E naught. All right, so what does the, the reversed direction look like? Well, reversed. Um, so, so first of all, we have 
Uh, let me sorry. Let me draw arrows on these things. So that one goes this way. This one goes that way. This one goes that way. All right. So instead of having waves come out, we have two waves coming in. So there's a wave coming in with amplitude t e naught, right? Because it's the same. E doesn't change. It just changes directions, sending t to minus t. Uh, there's a wave coming in this direction. With amplitude r, e naught again. The amplitude stays the same. I'm just reversing the direction. And what we expect to come out is an, a, a wave going that way with amplitude e naught. But this doesn't look. You know, if you actually had had waves that were coming in. If I, if I actually had a real laser beam that I was shining on this thing and I had a real laser beam that I was shining on this thing, you'd expect there to also be a reflection from, from this wave, right? Going that way. And you would expect to be some transmission from this wave going straight through. But, uh, but in fact, we, we will enforce, you know, because, because this is a valid solution to Maxwell's equations, in order to be a valid solution, this must also be a valid solution where, where there's zero coming out here. And now let's, let's write what these things are in terms of imagining a different set of reflections. So let me do something that, that, uh, that uh, I will use later. So let me, let me imagine that there are really two, two different materials here. So there's say air and glass, just to, just to be definite because one thing that, that's true is that the reflection coefficient here going from air to glass doesn't have to be the same as the reflection coefficient going from glass, uh, a glass to air interface. So, so we have to be a little bit careful about the bookkeeping there. And same thing with the transmission coefficients. So any, any uh, kind of right going, a wave hitting uh, an interface uh, on this side it's going to just have a, an R and a T as its reflection and transmission. A wave hitting from the opposite side, so like this wave, is going to have an R prime and a T prime. So this wave is still is still hitting the, the interface in the same way. So so let's let's analyze each of these. So so what when this wave hits, um, what what happens? Well, this wave here is is going to be some uh, reflection of this wave. So there's going to be an R squared E naught. That's one contribution to this wave. The other contribution to this wave is from this wave, T E naught transmitting. This is going to be plus, uh, I didn't leave myself much room here, plus, yeah, let, let me just rewrite this with more room. Okay, so, so we want, we want this to equal E naught in the end. But what this actually is, is some reflection squared E naught from this, this wave of this amplitude coming in and reflecting, and this wave transmitting. So plus T, T prime E naught. And we want this to equal the original amplitude. And how about here? We, we want this, this wave to destructively interfere. We want it to equal zero. But if we take into account our reflection and transmission coefficients, what does that actually equal? Well. There's this wave here, which is, uh, it starts off as, as R E naught. And it, it transmits going the normal direction. So there's another factor of T here. And there's also a contribution from, from this wave here. So T E naught. And this is reflecting, but it's reflecting from the kind of the inside of the mirror. So, so that's gonna be an R an R prime reflection. All right, so the Stokes relations are just saying that, look, this, this out, if, if, if this is a valid situation, it's time reversal should also be valid. And therefore, this, this outgoing wave has to be zero. And this outgoing wave has to have amplitude E naught. And just from those, those two relations, we, we can get a relationship between, uh, between, uh, the reflection and transmission coefficients. So you can see that here, if it's zero, I could just cancel the T E naught, cancel the T E naught, 
And this Stokes relation implies that R, R prime equals minus R. So hold on, this pen is running out. <clears throat> R prime equals minus R. Um, if, if you did the, the kind of quantum optics part of physics 51, there was some rule where, um, where if you're reflecting low to high, you add a pi, add a pi of phase shift. So that means a pi of phase shift, e to the i pi is negative one. So, so there we just said, if you're reflecting from a low index of refraction to a high index of refraction, the reflection coefficient is, is negative, what it, what it is in the opposite direction. So that's, that's true here. Um, here, we're, we're not specifying which, which direction has the negative. That, that comes from, uh, that, that doesn't come from this simple symmetry argument. But the fact that uh, reflecting from one side of the surface gives a, an opposite phase shift as reflecting from the other side of the surface, that just comes from the fact that if this is going to be a valid solution, it's time reversal better be also a valid solution. This is one Stokes relation. The other Stokes relation uh, is not quite as obvious, but it's just setting, setting this one equal to this. I can cancel out all the E naughts, and I get that uh, if, I, if I do that, I get R. Uh, I'll just write it over here because I've got room. I get uh, 1 equals R squared plus T, T prime. And I usually solve for, for T, T prime here. T, T prime equals uh, R, uh, one, 1 minus R squared. So these are the two Stokes relationships. Stokes relations, I guess they're called Stokes relations. And, and again, this just comes from the, the time, time reversal symmetry of Maxwell's equations and in, in this particular situation. So it's not true that any old reflection and transmission coefficients are gonna work on, on either side of this barrier. Um, the reflection coefficients have to be equal and opposite. The sign of the phase has to flip. And the, the transmission coefficients have to be one minus the reflection coefficients. And, and this second one is basically energy conservation. So, so what is this? This is the, uh, this is proportional to the intensity of the reflected light, right? It's, it's uh, the intensity of, of the original reflected light is R squared E naught. And this is proportional to the intensity of the transmitted light T squared E naught. And, uh, and so this energy conservation is kind of captured in the second Stokes relation. Um, and the first one is purely a, a wave property that has nothing to do with intensity. It just says that the, you know, if, if you shine light on a window, about 4% reflects back. When you see your reflection in the window, it's about 4% of the light reflecting back. Um, that 4% that comes with a, a negative sign if you're, if you're inside of a giant chunk of glass shining light on the, on the interface. So maybe the fish in the fish tank would, would see a, a sign flip in their reflections. But of course, unless you're doing some interference experiment, you never see that sign flip. But uh, we specifically are setting these things up to do an interesting interference experiment. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the basic setup. And, and these, are, these relations are used, are, well, it's pretty important to, to keep these in mind, whenever you do any, anything with beam splitters uh, that involves uh, wave interference. So uh, you have to be careful about the signs and the phases when you're doing a beam splitter that involves interference. Whereas if, if, you do, if you're not doing any interference, you could just say, well, okay, this mirror is 50% reflective or 99% reflective. And, and uh, the actual phases don't matter. All right, so, so let's, let's use this to set up the situation that I described before with my, my, uh, my cavities. So let me, maybe I'll, I'll erase this and pause and ask for questions as I'm erasing this bottom part here. Hopefully we'll, we'll get to the punchline where for certain certain wavelengths, the cavity can actually look perfectly transparent. Or 
Um, everyone's quiet, no questions. I'm going to erase this, give myself plenty of room to draw. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this problem up. Well, let, let me motivate this problem by saying that the, the one problem I will ask in the homework is a, a version of, of what I'm about to do that's a little bit more complicated because I am not going to keep track of any of the, the phases of the waves. I'm going to only consider the interesting case where, um, where I've got the cavity to be an integer number of wavelengths. So uh, upon a round trip, the uh, an integer number of wavelengths have passed. And there's no, the, the distance is just right so that there's no phase picked up. In the homework, I'm going to ask you to do it. I'm going to ask you to keep track of all the phase factors uh, when you go through this calculation. All right. So, so let's do this. Let's say we have um, two, two mirrors. And they're. Uh, I'm going to kind of look ahead a little bit here and say the actual uh, interesting surface of the mirror is going to be on the inside of the cavity. And you know, imagine this is a piece of glass coated with 99% reflective metal and another piece of glass coated with 99% reflective metal. And I put the metal towards each other. And on the back of the glass, I, I put a special coating so that it's perfectly transparent. So nothing interesting happens on, the, on this side. The only uh, you know, light goes, goes into the back of the mirror and, and nothing happens. But when it hits the, the coated surface of the mirror, that's where we have our interesting transmission and reflection business happening. So, so let's, let's, let's track what happens here. And uh, this will basically light's going to come in and some of it's going to reflect and some of it's going to bounce around. We have to sort of keep track of all these reflections. And then at the end of the day, we'll sum them all up and get something interesting. So uh, let's, let's draw light coming in with some initial E naught. Um, OK, so what's going to happen? Well, some of it's going to transmit. And we're going from uh, inside of the glass to outside of the glass. So this is actually T prime E naught. And some of it's going to reflect. And again, we're going from we're reflecting off of the, the glass to air interface. So this is R prime, E naught. Um, now the light's going to pick up some phase because there's some distance that it has to travel. This is what you'll have to add in, in your homework, but I'm, I'm not going to add it. I'm going to assume that it travels the integer number of uh, wavelengths. And so there's no net, net phase. I'm solving this for a special case. Uh, and then at this interface, some of it transmits out and some of it reflects. And well, what transmits out? Well, here I started with T prime E naught and I have another transmission, but this time I'm going from, from air into the glass. So that's the normal, the normal situation. So I have T, T prime E naught here. And here I have, I start out with T prime E naught and I reflect, but it's a normal kind of reflection. So here I have R T prime E naught. And now I have to do it again. So some of it comes out, some of it reflects. And again, I'm not worrying about the fact that this picks up a, a phase because I've, I've got the mirror's position so that that phase is uh, that e to the i phase factor gives me just a factor of one. Whereas in your homework, you have to write e to the i k d. Mirrors are separated by d. Uh, okay, so here's a reflection. It's a it's a normal reflection. So here I get an R squared, T prime, E naught, and here's a normal transmission. So here I get an R, T prime, and uh, another uh, factor of T here. And I have to do it again. Eventually, a pattern will will emerge, and I'll I'll be able to stop. Um, so I started out with an R squared T prime, and now I'm transmitting. So I have an R, R squared T prime E naught, and now I'm transmitting again. So now I have another uh, factor of T. I do it again. I'll do it enough times to see the pattern here. So here's a, a regular reflection. So this is R, uh, R cubed, R cubed T prime E naught. 
and what comes out here is going to be uh, r cubed t prime. I'm running out of pen again. Okay, r cubed t prime e naught. That's what we started with times another uh, regular transmission t. And we can keep going on and on and on. Let me do one more here, just because I think it's easy to see the pattern with one more. Okay, so this is this is this plus another reflection. So r to the fourth t prime e naught. And now what comes out here is going to be uh, the same thing here, except r to the fourth. So t r to the fourth t prime e naught. All right, and this keeps going and going and going. Now that's what happens if you put the the thing in at some funny angle. Let's actually, um, let's imagine putting it in at, at zero angle so that all of these transmission things are all on top of each other. All of these reflection things are all on top of each other. And let's let's do the bookkeeping here. Let me, uh, I don't know if I have enough room. I, I may have to do it sort of one at a time. Let's, well, let's do the punchline here because this is easy to add up, right? All of these terms are TT prime E naught T T prime e naught, T T prime e naught. It's just we start out with. So so let me say the the transmission here, this side, is T T prime e naught times what? Well, one plus r squared plus r to the fourth. And if you continue the pattern, plus dot dot dot, as you just get more and more and more powers of r. Now remember that if you had uh, one plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth. You kept adding that up. As long as the magnitude of x was less than one, you could do this sum. We did it last time. This is one over one minus x. And so uh, this, this just becomes uh, e naught, the initial thing, times t, t prime over one minus r squared. All right, because my x here is r squared. And look at this. Our Stokes relation says that tt prime equals one minus r squared. And so for the particular case where I pick up no additional phase or no net phase, right, I've gone an integer number of wavelengths, what I get out is, is exactly what I get put in. And that, that's pretty cool. That means that all the light that I put in ends up coming out. That also means that all of this stuff must cancel somehow. So let's, let's work that out. Uh, okay, I'm going to erase this. On my piece of paper, I worked this out down here, but I have no room for that. Okay. All right, so let's work out what uh, what comes back. So this is a little bit more complicated. You have to go, go a few terms to see the pattern. So, so what, what comes back is E naught plus... Um, R prime E naught plus, uh, okay, so, so here's where the pattern starts. There's, um, there's always going to be a T and a T prime because we have one transmission uh, in and then one transmission back out. So there's always going to be a T, T prime E naught. And then we have a single r, an r cubed, an r to the fourth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in fact, let me factor out one of those r's to make it in the same form. So factor out one of those r's. So here, this is a one. This is an r cubed. So I have an r squared left over. And if I were to keep doing this over and over again, I would get plus r to the fourth plus dot, 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 dot. So, so now my infinite sum starts here instead of starting right away. Okay, so let me let me just say that I'm going to factor out an overall e naught, and I get one plus r prime plus this is r t t prime over one minus r squared when I do the infinite sum. And again. What we see from the Stokes relationship here is that this top term equals this bottom term. So this, this whole thing turns into a one. 
And what we see from this first Stokes relationship here is that R plus R prime is zero. So then this whole thing, uh, I don't know how to write that, this whole thing, uh, these cancel with each other. So here we're just left with, um, oh, whoops, I screwed up, hold on. This, this incoming E naught doesn't count because that's, that's coming in. So we're just counting the sum of the things that come out. So I shouldn't have, I should have started there. I should have started just, just with the things that come out. So the sum of all the things that come out, starting with here, this plus this plus this plus this all the way down, um, that, that is zero. So uh, let me just say out equals this in uh, through maybe. Through equals this. And then there's also inside. So I can write, uh, write a relationship for, for what's inside. And that's, that's the final piece. And, uh, okay, let me, okay, we're done with the stuff that comes out. I'm gonna erase that. Uh, sorry, I should have called this not out. I should have called this back. Stuff that comes back, the stuff that goes through, and now the stuff that, that stays inside. Uh, uh, okay, inside. Inside. And here we have to break it up into a, a right going inside and a left going inside. So let me say inside to the, to the right. So if I take all the things that go to the right, it's going to be T uh, E naught times T prime times one plus R squared plus R to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. So this is E, e naught uh, T prime over one minus R squared. So I can take my one minus R squared and replace it with T, T prime, so this is just E naught over T. Okay, so, so before I go and calculate the left, left going, and maybe, maybe I won't even bother, it's, it's a very similar procedure. Um, let me just ask, what is, the, what is the intensity of this? Well, the intensity, uh, intensity, intensity of the right going of right going inside stuff. Um, well, this is the magnitude of this thing squared. So what is the magnitude of this thing squared? Well, oh, magnitude of this thing squared over uh, two eta or whatever. So the magnitude of E naught squared over two eta, that's just the intensity, the initial intensity, I naught. And that gets divided by, uh, come on, divided by, the magnitude of T squared. And remember if our mirrors are 99% reflective, that means they're only 1% transmissive. So, so if, if magnitude of R squared is 0.99, that means that magnitude of T squared transmission of the intensity is 0.01. And so this, for, for our example that I keep using, this is something like uh, 100 times the initial intensity. So what that means is that it's, you know, when, we, when we decrease this angle to zero and, and let everything build up, um, in, in the final analysis where we've uh, put, put these, these cavities to be the right distance and on all the phases are, are one, uh, we have some intensity coming in and we have some huge intensity bouncing back and forth. If we were to somehow measure that intensity, we would see a huge intensity a hundred times the input. And then we would have that same, same I naught coming back out. Uh, and, and as soon as you move this cavity a little tiny bit, that constructive interference uh, disappears and this thing turns into an extremely good mirror again. So as soon as you move D a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a wavelength, uh, this, 
uh, th this stuff no longer destructively interferes and you get a, a huge a huge reflection. So uh, I know it's, it's, it's pretty neat and it's very useful because you can use this to measure the spectrum of what's coming in by changing the, the separation of these mirrors. And as you change it, you can measure how much light comes out of this cavity. And as, this, as the cavity scans through integer multiples of, of the incoming wavelength, different amounts of light come out. And you can use that to measure the spectrum of the light that's coming in. That's an optical cavity analyzer. All right, and uh, I guess unusually for me, I'm ending uh, two minutes early. I'm happy to take any questions about this. The, the one problem in the homework is to just keep track of all these phases, all these e to the i kds upon each reflection. And then do, do everything, do all the sums again, and you, you will get, uh, you know, we'll get some term involving the sign of sign of KD like we did last lecture, but but properly taking into account all of the all of the reflection coefficients, and then I'll ask you to plot it in various special cases. All right, no questions. I will stop recording.